What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Primetime Sports Podcast, hosted by Joey Miller. So today is the start of college football. I know I previewed the BC game already yesterday with Paul from Southie. Now today I'm going to give a breakdown of the top 25 teams in the College Football Associated Press poll. I'll give you guys a breakdown of each of those teams, give you guys a look at some players on each squad to keep your eye on. Then I'm going to give a college football playoff prediction. I'll get into who I think is going to win each conference. And then at the end, I'm going to do some hot takes and predictions for the season overall, including some awards predictions as well for the Heisman Trophy, among other awards. So we'll start off with the number one team in the country, that is Georgia. Back-to-back national champions. They don't have Stetson Bennett at quarterback anymore today. It'll be Carson Beck at quarterback for them. Without Stetson Bennett, it's definitely going to be a different offense to watch with Beck taking over. Beck has a very strong arm. In 13 career appearances, he has six passing touchdowns and two interceptions. Does have good mobility, seven carries for 43 yards last year, behind a very good offensive line there for Georgia. Georgia hasn't lost a home game since 2019. Wide receiver Lad McConkey is back at wide receiver with them, returning for another year. 58 catches to 760 yards last year and seven touchdowns. Also added a couple rushing touchdowns as well. And then they have one of the best defensive backs coming back, and that is Javon Boyd, a safety for them, who had 14 games played last year, 46 tackles, seven tackles for a loss, three and a half sacks, two interceptions, three passes defended in a fumble recovery. And he also was a college football national championship defensive MVP with two picks in that game against TCU. He's a guy to keep your eye on. Number two team in the country is Michigan. Jim Harbaugh is suspended for the first three games of the season. They do have easy matchups, though, so it shouldn't be a big deal. East Carolina, UNLV, and Bowling Green. So three easier matchups. So without Jim Harbaugh, they'll be fine. And if you look at it, they have an easier schedule overall this season. They're at Penn State, which is a tough game, then home versus Ohio State. But besides that, they should be favored in every single game rather easily. They were 13-1 last year, 12-0 in the regular season. They lost to TCU in the Fiesta Bowl last year, 51-45. to their quarterback is still there, and that is J.J. McCarthy back for his junior year. 22 passing touchdowns and five picks last year. 2,700 passing yards and five rushing touchdowns. Not the biggest fan of McCarthy. I think he's a good quarterback, but I don't think he's going to win them a national championship. The offense did rely on running back Blake Corum a ton last year before he got hurt. In 12 games played, he had 1,400 rush yards, 18 touchdowns on the ground, and a touchdown reception. So 19 total touchdowns. Obviously a very dangerous back. And they still also have former Everett High defensive back and wide receiver Mike Sainer is still there for another year at Michigan. Could have went to the NFL draft this past year, but opted to go back to Michigan for another year. A two-time captain now. He's a guy to watch out for in that defense. And then linebacker Michael Barrett returns for his sixth season in college football. 72 tackles last year, five tackles for loss, three and a half sacks, and two interceptions, including a pick six last season there for Michigan on defense. Next up is Ohio State. They do not have C.J. Stroud at quarterback anymore, but they do have the top wide receiver in the country, and that is Marvin Harrison Jr., back for his junior season at Ohio State. 77 catches for 1,260 yards last year and 14 touchdowns. Will be a top pick in this year's draft in 2024 coming up for sure. They also have another top college wide receiver in Amika Ibuka, who had 74 catches last year, including 1,150 yards and 10 touchdowns, to go along with two rushing touchdowns as well. So 12 total touchdowns last year for Ibuka. Almost a lock to be a top 15 to 20 pick in the 2024 draft, along with Harrison, two very talented wide receivers. The quarterback battle was between two guys, one being Michael McCord, who played in 12 games over the last two years with three passing touchdowns and two picks. Devin Brown is a sophomore quarterback who has never thrown a passing touchdown or a pass at all in college in his career. It looks like McCord will get the start, though, so Brown unexperienced quarterback, won't get the start in their first game of the season. Linebacker Tommy Eichenberg returns for another year for Ohio State's defense. He led them in tackles last year with 120 tackles, 12 tackles for a loss, two and a half sacks, an interception that was returned for a touchdown, and three passes defended, the anchor of their defense, and one of the best linebackers in the country, and an elite run stopper. He's definitely got to keep your eye on throughout the course of the season. They have three cakewalk matchups to begin the season. Indiana, Youngstown State, and then Western Kentucky. They do have a game against Notre Dame, though, at Notre Dame on September 23rd, which will be a tougher game. And then versus Penn State at home on October 21st. And then at Michigan, November 25th. They have an easier schedule, though, like Michigan on the season. Next up, the number four team, that is Alabama. They no longer stand out quarterback and number one pick in the draft from 2023 in Bryce Young. He is gone, as I said, number one pick in the draft to the Carolina Panthers in this past draft. Quarterback Jalen Monroe will take over for them at quarterback. He had five passing touchdowns and three interceptions last year with 263 rushing yards on the ground. He averaged eight and a half yards per carry, which is very impressive. Also had a rushing touchdown as well. So obviously you could help very mobile quarterback that can make a name for himself this year with a very strong arm, great rushing ability, likes to scramble. I think he can have 35 total touchdowns this season with a very good run blocking offensive line and a talented offense around him. I think he's going to be able to put up 35 total touchdowns. 
And their backup quarterback is Tyler Buckner, former Notre Dame quarterback. They do have a tough schedule this year, though. They play eight top 30 AP teams right now in the current poll. They're at Texas in week two, which is the number 11 team in the country, versus the number 22 team in Ole Miss on September 23rd. Then they play the number 23rd team in the country in Texas A&M on October 7th. And then they play the number 12 team in Tennessee on October 21st. And they play LSU, the number five team in the country, on November 4th. Alabama was 11-2 this past year. So even though it was a down year for them, they still won 11 games. As for who they have coming back, wide receiver Ja'Cory Brooks is a returning weapon for them at the wide receiver position. 39 catches, 674 yards, and 8 touchdowns. Very talented wide receiver that I think joins the Alabama wide receiver dynasty this year. I think he has 12 touchdowns, at least double digits. If it's not 12, let's say 10. I think he's going to be a name to remember, just like former Alabama wide receivers that include Kelvin Ridley, Jalen Waddell, Devontae Smith, John Mechie, Jamison Williams, Jerry Judy. The list goes on and on of wide receivers there at Alabama that have had success in college and then in the NFL. And they also have running back Jace McClellan back for another year, 655 yards on the ground last year with seven rushing touchdowns and three touchdown receptions as well. Linebacker Dallas Turner is a potential top pick in this NFL draft in 2024. I'd say top 10 probably as of now. 37 tackles last year, eight tackles for a loss, four sacks, a fumble recovery return for a touchdown. I expect him to take another step this season for Alabama. With Bama losing Will Anderson to the NFL draft, they need somebody to step up. I think Turner's going to be that guy. Maybe 12 tackles for a loss and let's say eight sacks. That's just a projection, but I think he's going to have a breakout year there even more for Alabama's defense. LSU is the number five team in the country. Quarterback Jada Daniels took a major stride for them last year at the helm. 14 games for the Tigers, and he had 17 passing touchdowns or three picks to go along with 2,900 passing yards and 885 rushing yards with 11 rushing touchdowns and a receiving touchdown as well. So if you combine all that up, he had 29 total touchdowns. He used his legs very well, makes it hard to stop him. He was a former quarterback at Arizona State before transferring to LSU. He excelled right away as a freshman in 2019 at Arizona State. With 17 passing touchdowns, two interceptions, and three rushing touchdowns, he's become a much better runner over the last couple seasons. They do have a tough schedule, though, as everyone and the SEC does have a tough schedule. They open up the season tomorrow night playing against Florida State, which will be a tough game. I think Florida State ends up winning that one. Then they also play the number 22 team in the country in Ole Miss. They also play the number 4 team in Alabama and the number 23 team in Texas A&M. One guy to watch out for is Malik Neighbors, a wide receiver for them, who had 1,000 receiving yards last year and three touchdowns. And then sophomore linebacker Harold Perkins, probably the best player overall on this team, I would say, was just a freshman last year and had 13 tackles for a loss with 7.5 sacks, 72 total tackles, an interception, Two passes defended and four forced fumbles. He's a future first-round pick in the NFL draft for sure. Maybe a top 10 to 15 pick, let's say, in the 2025 draft, the way things stand now. Now I'm going to move on to the number six team in the country, that is USC, who was 11-3 last year. They had a very good season. Their defense was their biggest flaw last year. I think it's going to be the same thing for this season yet again. They allowed 29 points per game last year, which is 94th in college football. And they lost their top defensive player in the second round. In this past draft, to the Los Angeles Chargers, and that was Chewy Peloto, who had 46 tackles last year with 22 tackles for loss, which is ridiculous. 13 and a half sacks, which was number one in college football. Three passes defended and two forced fumbles. Their quarterback is Caleb Williams, who is back for another year there for USC. He could become the second player in NCAA history to win the Heisman back-to-back years. Right now, he is the favorite. And last week, he had a big game against San Jose State, a game that USC won 56-28. Now they will face Nevada in their next game today. Offense isn't an issue, though, for USC. They had 41 points per game last year, which is third best in college football. They have one of, if not the most, electrifying player in the nation in freshman phenom wide receiver Zachariah Branch. A guy to get to know now, I would say, is a guy that's definitely going to be a lot more popular as the year goes on. I think USC does struggle, though, versus Washington and Oregon. USC's defense isn't great, and it's definitely much weaker than Washington's in Oregon's will be this year. So I think they're going to struggle this year, USC defensively. I think that's what keeps them out of the college football playoff. The number 17 in the country is Penn State, who was 11-2 last year. They have quarterback Drew Allen back at quarterback for them. He was the backup last year, though, to Sean Clifford. Just four passing touchdowns last year in limited snaps. According to reports, though, he looked very good in practice over the summer. Didn't throw a pick in 13 practices, which is very impressive since Penn State has a very strong defense. I get Josh Allen vibes when I watch him play. He's 6'5 with a cannon of an arm and good mobility. So I think Allen are a solid comp would be Josh Allen. I'm not saying he is Josh Allen, but a similar build, similar play style as Josh Allen. 
Penn State's defense allowed just 18 points per game last year, which is 10th best in the country. And they also scored 36 points per game on offense, which is 20th best in the nation. The top two backs are back for another year. That's Nicholas Singleton, who had 1,000 rush yards last year, 12 rushing touchdowns. Averaging 6.8 yards per carry with a touchdown reception as well. And the Catron Allen is their other back who had 867 rushing yards, 10 rushing touchdowns, and a touchdown reception as well. They picked up a transfer wide receiver, Dante Seifert from Kent State. For the Golden Flashes last year, he had 48 catches for 744 yards and three touchdowns. He had nine touchdowns in 2021. He's very capable of being a big play receiver. They open up with West Virginia and then face the number 25 team in the country on September 23rd against Iowa. So that's a tough matchup there. And they also face the number three team in the country in Ohio State on October 21st and the number two team in the country in Michigan on November 11th. A hot schedule, but a very good defense and strong playmakers on offense. I think they're very capable of making a run. They lost their top defensive player, though, cornerback Jair Brown to the NFL draft, who is now on the 49ers, a guy that we will break up rookie for sure in that defense for San Francisco. He had 74 tackles last year with seven tackles for loss as well. With four and a half sacks, four interceptions, three passes defended, a fumble recovery for a touchdown, and two forced fumbles. So even though they lose Brown in the secondary, they do have their leader in sacks back for another season, and that is linebacker Abdul Carter with 56 tackles last year with six and a half sacks, ten and a half tackles for a loss, four passes defended, and two forced fumbles. And then Adisa Isaac is another pass rusher for them, a defensive end that was the leader in tackles for a loss last year for the Nittany Lions. With 11 tackles for loss and also at four sacks as well. Next up is the number eight team in the country, and that is Florida State. Their biggest test of the season will be tomorrow against LSU. They're underdogs in that game, but I think Florida State wins that matchup. When you have a top pass rusher and a top quarterback, that is a formula to win a national championship, and at least compete for it, let's say. They were 10 3 last year, and they still are bringing back one of the best pass rushers in the country and a top quarterback as well. The quarterback is Jordan Travis, who had 3,200 passing yards last year, 24 touchdowns, 5 interceptions, with 417 rushing yards and 7 rushing touchdowns. He really developed over the last couple seasons for Florida State, has become a much better passer and a better decision maker. I think he takes another step up this year with maybe, let's say, 37 to 38 total touchdowns. Now he's a veteran in this system. He's experienced and has some good playmakers around him. I expect him to take a big step up this upcoming year and do even better than he did last year. Last year was a very good year, 24 touchdowns, 7 rushing touchdowns as well. So it's 31 total. I think he goes for 37 to 38 at least this year. They also have the top wide receiver returning. That is Johnny Wilson, who had 43 catches for almost 900 yards last year and 5 touchdowns. Wilson is another guy that I see taking up a big step this year. I think he takes another step up and improves even more. Last year, he had five touchdowns. He's six foot seven. Just toss it up to him. He's a matchup nightmare. I think he's going to go for double digit touchdowns this year, and hopefully that is the case. I am rooting for Florida State to do well. They also picked up a transfer wide receiver from Michigan State, and that is Keon Coleman, who had eight touchdowns last year for Michigan State with almost 800 yards and 58 catches. He's got to watch out for in that offense. And the defensive lineman, Jared Verse, is back for his junior year. One of the best defensive players in the country. 17 tackles for a loss last year with nine sacks, a fumble recovery, and 48 tackles. Could end up being a top 10 pick in this year's draft in 2024. They do have some tough games on Florida State. They're home versus LSU at Clemson at Florida. Three tough games there. But if they go 2-1 and one in that stretch, maybe even 3-0, oh, they're, they're locked to make the cultural play if they go 3-0 in oh that stretch because imagine they're not going to lose anybody else during the course of the season. But if they were to, let's say, they lose one other game and lose one of these two, they'd be 10 to 2, still maybe have a shot. You probably have to lose only one game to make the college football playoff. But I think they're capable of winning all three of those games with LSU, Clemson, and Florida. Then next up, we have the number nine team in the country, and that is Clemson. Cade Klubnick is their starting quarterback. They no longer have DJ Ungalele. He is now a transfer for Oregon State. Last year, Klubnick had two touchdowns with three interceptions in 10 games with two rushing touchdowns as well. Not as high on him as most. He's good, but I don't think they get double-digit wins this year, and probably because of the quarterback play. I think he's good, but I don't think he's going to get them back to making it to the college football playoff. I say Clemson goes maybe 9-3 and three this year. A lot of people have them winning the ACC. I think Florida State's a better team. The ACC is always better when Florida State's competitive and nationally regarded as a top team. The same goes for Clemson. So it's definitely going to be exciting now in the ACC considering Florida State's good and Clemson's good. But I think Florida State is the better squad. Clemson has wide receiver Bo Collins back. He's a 6'3", 195-pound receiver who had 22 catches last year for almost 400 yards and five touchdowns. I'd imagine he gets his touchdown total up this year, though, to maybe seven or eight touchdowns. He had five last year. I think he takes another step up. Running back Will Shipley is back for Clemson. Almost 1,200 rushing yards last year with 15 touchdowns on the ground. He's been a big playmaker for them since stepping on the field over the last couple of seasons. And then safety, Andrew McCuba is their best defensive player. 54 tackles last year with an interception and three passes defended. 
The number 10 team in the country is Washington. They were 11-2 last year, averaging 40 points per game, which was 7th best in the country. I would say the most underrated team in college football this year is Washington. I think they could be a college football playoff team, and no one's really talking about them because of USC taking all the attention away. They have one of the best quarterbacks in the country, Michael Penix. 31 passing touchdowns last year with 4,600 passing yards. Number one in college football in passing yards with eight interceptions, 65% completion percentage, and four rushing touchdowns. I think he's very capable of 40 passing touchdowns this season. And if you look at it, he took a big step up last year. I think he can take another step up this year. I think he's really developed his game. And if you look at it, he went from Indiana to Washington. Really improved a lot, especially passing-wise. He's very accurate. I think he's very capable of taking a big step up this year and going for 40 passing touchdowns. He's got to keep your eye on, though, as a high pick in the 2023 NFL Draft. They also have wide receiver Rome Odunes, who I think is the second or third best wide receiver in college football besides Marvin Harrison Jr. He's definitely in the conversation to be second or third. He's a six foot three, 200-pound wide receiver with elite route running skills, explosive speed, and can go up and get it. He's very good in traffic, makes plays when you don't expect it. He had 75 catches last year for 1,100 yards, which is 12th best in college football, and seven touchdown receptions with a rushing touchdown as well. I think he gets 10 touchdowns this year with 1,400 yards. Then they also have wide receiver Jamie McMillan, who is back for another year, 79 catches last year for 1,100 yards and nine touchdowns. Another great playmaker for Penix in that Washington offense makes them even more dangerous. As for their defense, Braylon Trice is their best player. He's a linebacker who had 12 tacks for loss, 38 tackles, and 9 sacks last season. Could be a defensive player of the year in the Pac-12 this year. If he were to win it, I wouldn't be surprised. Washington does have a harder schedule this year than last. They have to play USC and Utah this year, but I'm high on them because of Penix. I think they have a very good season. So I know I said at the beginning of the episode that I was going to go through all of the top 25 teams. Unfortunately, I do have to run going to the BC game in just a few minutes. So I'm going to give the whole 11 through 25 breakdown later on. But I do want to give a look at my predictions, though, before I do leave for the game. And then, I'll, as I said, I'll record the top 11 through 25 teams in the AP poll before week one. I'll give you a look at every one of those teams from 11 to 25. So let's start off with my college football playoff prediction. I have Alabama being the number one seed going 12-1. and one. I have Penn State being the number two seed going 12-1. and one. I have Florida State as the number three seed going 12-1. and one. And then I have Washington being the fourth seed going 12-1. and one. And then I did my first two out being Wisconsin, who goes 10-3. and three, And I have Georgia going 11-2. and two. And then rounding out the next six to round out the top ten, I have Tennessee going 10-2. and two. Texas going 11 and 2, LSU 9 and 3, Michigan 10 and 2, USC 10 and 2, and Ohio State 9 and 3. I don't really buy into Georgia, so that's why I have them missing the college football playoff, even though it's tough to really bet against them and say they're not going to make it. I had to have some hot takes in here, and I don't really believe Costa Beck is going to be the answer for them at quarterback. I don't think he's going to be as great as Stetson Bennett was over the last couple seasons for the Georgia Bulldogs offense. So if I'm not buying into Beck, I can't really buy into them making the college football playoff. I think there is a drop-off between Bennett and Beck, so that's what makes me wary. So I have Georgia going 11-2 and and being one of the first two teams out on making it to the college football playoff. So in the Sugar Bowl, it is a one versus 4 seeds matching up. I have Alabama versus Washington. I have Alabama winning that game 38-27. And then in the Rose Bowl, it would be the 2-3 and three seeds would match up. So it's Penn State versus Florida State. And this is a tough one for me. I am really torn between both teams winning this game. My predictions... I'm going to go with Penn State winning this game, though, 27-23. Tough pick there. I do like both teams. I think it would be a great matchup to watch, but I'm going to go with Penn State winning that game, 27-23. And then in the finals, it would be Alabama versus Penn State, and I have Alabama winning that game, 31-28. I'm torn on that one as well. I think it'll be close. Whether it's Alabama-Penn State, Alabama-Florida State, whatever it may be, I'm torn between those last two games I mentioned, the Rose Bowl and the College Football Playoff Final. I'm going to go with Alabama, though, over Penn State, 31-28. But I think it'll be a good matchup to watch. As for the Peach Bowl, I have Wisconsin, who's going 10-3, and going up against USC in my predictions. USC, I'm going 10-2. and I have Wisconsin winning that game, 41-38. And the Fiesta Bowl, I have Georgia, an 11-2 team, going up against Michigan, who is 10-2 in my predictions. And I have Michigan winning that game, 31-27. Then the Cotton Bowl would be Texas, who I have going 11-2, versus Tennessee, who is going 10-2 in my predictions. I have Tennessee winning that game, 30-27. I had Ohio State versus Tennessee originally for the Cotton Bowl, but I changed it and just mixed it up. Had Tennessee going up against Texas rather than Ohio State. And then the Orange Bowl, I have LSU being a 9-3 team going up against Tulane here, who I have going 11-2 overall in the regular season. So I have LSU versus Tulane there in the Orange Bowl, and I have LSU winning that game 28-27. I think it would be a close game and a fun one to watch. I have Tulane just being outside the top 10 by the end of the season. I have them at 12. So I think they have a very good year at 11-2. Now, who's going to win each conference? We'll start off with the SEC. 
I have Alabama and Georgia going at it in the finals. I have Alabama winning that game. Alabama over Georgia. I think it'd be a fun one to watch if that were to be the matchup there. I like Tennessee, though, as a dark horse to win the SEC. As for the Big Ten, I have Penn State over Wisconsin. I know it's a hot take, but I think it makes things interesting when you have Penn State over Wisconsin. Because I think a lot of people can have Michigan and Ohio State. Even Penn State, obviously, with the Big Ten East being those three teams, it's very competitive. Michigan, Penn State, and Ohio State. I want to make things interesting, so I had Penn State over Wisconsin. I think Penn State's the best team in the Big Ten, and I think Wisconsin is going to be very good this year as well. So I had Penn State over Wisconsin in the Big Ten. As for the Big 12, I have Texas over Kansas State. In the ACC, I have Florida State over Clemson. In the Pac-12, I have Washington over USC. The Mountain West Conference, this is tough. I love San Jose State. I wanted to pick them to win it, but they do have a very tough matchup this week against Oregon State. Last week, they had to go up against USC, so... If they were to lose both those games, they've already had two losses, and some other teams in that conference have easier games to play at the beginning of the season. But here's the thing. I want to pick against them and maybe have them losing in the finals. And then I said, if I have them going to the Mountain West Conference final game, the championship game, I'm going to have them winning. So I have San Jose State going 8-4, and four, and I have them beating Boise State, who I have going 10-2. This is a pick from the hot. I'm a San Jose State fan now. Over the past week now, I've become a fan of them. I like the way they play. I hope they win the conference, so I'm going to stay with them, winning over Boise State. Then in the MAC, I have Ohio over Toledo. The Sun Belt, I have South Alabama over Marshall. In the American Athletic Conference, I have UTSA, UT San Antonio going 9-3 and and beating Tulane in an upset game. I have Tulane going 11-1, and and that's 11-1 in the regular season. I know I had them at 11-2 when I talked about them just a minute ago playing in the Orange Bowl versus LSU, but I have them going 11-1 in the regular season. UT San Antonio is going to be dangerous, though. The Roadrunners are a very underrated team. They do have to play Tennessee and Tulane in the regular season, but they do have a very good quarterback. Frank Harris is a pure playmaker, one of the best group of five quarterbacks in the country. 32 touchdowns last year passing with nine interceptions, 4,000 passing yards, had a 70% completion percentage, 600 rushing yards, and nine rushing touchdowns. I think he's going to light it up this year for 45 total touchdowns and let's say 5,000 total yards. And then the Conference USA, I have it going down to Louisiana Tech and Liberty. I have Louisiana Tech winning that conference there. Nine and three, I have them going in the regular season, beating Liberty, who I had going 10 and two. Liberty, 10-2 team. They have a very easy schedule in the regular season. They won eight games last year, so they had a very good team last year. They opened up with Bowling Green on the year. But I have Louisiana Tech upsetting them in the final. Louisiana Tech, 9-3. I have them going in my prediction. Quarterback Hank Bachmeyer opened up the season last week with 333 passing yards, a touchdown, and an interception. He's going to have a good year for them. And they also have a very electric wide receiver in Smoke Harris. I think Harris has a very big year for them on offense. He started the season hot last week with 11 catches for 155 yards and a touchdown in their 22-17 win over Florida International. I think he has a very big year for them and leads them to a championship in the Conference USA Tournament. So now for some hot takes. I have Wisconsin over eight and a half wins. I think they win the Big Ten East. That's not really as much of a hot take as most. I think a good amount of people like Wisconsin to be a very good team this year, but I don't think anybody has them being the five team overall at the end of the season and just missing the college football playoff. I have them losing two games in the regular season and finishing 10-3 and three overall before their bowl game going into wherever they're going to play. But they're going to have a very good bowl game. If they were to be 10-3 and three after losing in the Big Ten Championship, they would have a very good chance of being a very good bowl game, probably a New Year's Six game, I'd imagine. And then next up, I have Tulane quarterback Michael Pratt being a dark horse candidate at the Heisman this year. I think he finishes top five. I think Tulane gets double-digit wins this year. And I think Pratt is very capable of 45 total touchdowns this season. Chevin Cordero, I think he leads San Jose State to eight wins. I think he has a combined 40 touchdowns. Even if they don't win eight games, I think the 40 touchdowns is in range. I think he could have a combined 40 total touchdowns this upcoming season. He's a very good quarterback that I think everyone's going to grow to know over the course of the season. I don't think Georgia three-peats. That's a prediction of mine. I have them losing two games in the regular season and just missing the college football playoff. I think LSU goes under double-digit wins. I have them winning probably nine games. I'd say just missing double digits, but I have them losing, though, enough there not to get double-digit wins in the regular season. I think Notre Dame loses two of three games to Ohio State, Clemson, and USC. I think Riley Leonard, the quarterback for Duke, leads Duke to a bowl game and gets himself in the conversation as a long-shot dark horse candidate for the Heisman. I think he has 42 total touchdowns this season with 30 passing and 12 rushing. I think Duke goes 8-4 and four in the regular season. I think only one SEC team makes it into the college football playoff, and I'm going to go only one Big Ten team as well. I think Tulane ends up playing in a New Year's Six game yet again for another year, and then I think Colorado wins four games. 
I know their win totals are three and a half. I think they're capable of going over that. I'm going to have them at maybe four or five wins in Coach Prime's first season. Let's say four wins because it's probably tough to say five or six wins. Let's say four wins, which still wouldn't be bad in a building year there for the program. And now for some awards predictions. For the Heisman, most outstanding player in the country, I'm going to go quarterback Michael Penix Jr., a quarterback for Washington. For some long shot dark horses, though, that I like, Tanner Mordecai, quarterback for Wisconsin, and then Joe Milton, quarterback for Tennessee. My top five for the Heisman, I'm going to go Penix at one, Jordan Travis at two, Drew Eller at three, Caleb Williams at four, and Quinshawn Judkins at five, with Michael Pratt being in the conversation at five as well. So I'm going to go Judkins slash Pratt with the fifth overall there for the Heisman race. Davey O'Brien, the best quarterback award. I wanted to say Michael Penix, but I wanted to pick a different answer than that one. So I'm going to go with a different winner than my Heisman pick, and I'm going to go Jordan Travis of Florida State for the best quarterback in the country. Winning the Davey O'Brien Award for the Doak Walker Award, the best running back. I'm going to go Quinshawn Judkins of Ole Miss. He had 1,500 rushing yards last year with 16 touchdowns on the ground in a touchdown reception. Had some big games, including a game last year against Bam where he had two touchdowns in 135 yards. He's going to be a guy to watch out for this year. Braywin Allen, Wisconsin running back, I like as well. 1,200 rushing yards last year in 11 touchdowns. I think he's capable of taking a step up this year and going for 1,600 yards and 18 touchdowns. Wisconsin offense is going to be more improved this year with Mordecai under center, which could probably help Braywin Allen get more red zone scores. Lombardi Award, which is given to the best lineman. I'm going to go Dallas Turner of Alabama. The Outland Award, which is given to the best interior lineman, regardless of offense or defense. I'm going to go Joe Alt on Notre Dame. A tackle there for them, winning that award. The Belitnikoff Award, given to the best wide receiver. I'm going to go Marvin Harrison Jr. of Ohio State. I think Xavier Worthy of Texas, though, is a solid pick there, though, as a dark horse candidate to win. I think Harrison Jr. is the favorite, but I think Xavier Worthy, though, is definitely going to be in the conversation. I even being right there with Harrison Jr., the Chuck Bednarik Award is given to the best defensive player, and I'm going to go Jarrett Verse of Florida State winning that. The Butkus Award is given to the best linebacker. I'm going to go Harold Perkins of LSU. And if you look at it, he could also be the Bednarik Award winner as well. Very good defensive player. Going to be that anchor in that LSU defense. I was split between him and Tommy Eichenberg here for the best linebacker, but end up going with Perkins there. For the Thorpe Award, given to the best defensive back, I'm going to go Kool-Aid McKinstry of Alabama, cornerback. Very capable of winning that award. And for the Paul Horning Award, Winner, that's the most versatile player in the country. I'm going to go with the electric Zachariah Branch, who had a kick return touchdown last week for San Jose State. I think he lights it up with USC this year. So that's a look at my predictions there for who I think is going to win, the Heisman, and also who I think is going to win each conference. And as I said, after the BC game, hopefully I'll be able to give you a whole breakdown of the teams from 11 through 25 in the top 25 poll before the season begins in week one. Unfortunately, I do have to run to the BC game. But anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to this. As always, it's much appreciated, and I hope you guys have a good one. Enjoy the first week of college football. This is the best time of the year, and the NFL is kicking off next Thursday night. So even though college is starting now, the NFL is right around the corner as well. So enjoy it while we can. I will see you guys in the next episode. Hopefully you guys enjoy this, and thank you as always. Much appreciated.